Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for what promises to be an invigorating presentation by the 2019 Winter Daner Distinguished Visiting Fellow, Pitbull Abhichan Dani. As many of you know, uh, starting in 2004, the Daner Fellow Program was created through, through the generosity of Professor Dick Daner and his wife, uh, Carol Daner. Twice a year, the program brings nationally recognized public interest leaders, campus for lecture, a roundtable discussion, and a series of individual meetings with students to promote how legal skills can be used to make the world a better place. Thank you, as always, to Dave and Carol. This year, we welcome uh, our own uh, the Executive Director of the General Service Foundation on uh, campus, uh, Dimple Abachandani. Dimple received her BA in English with honors at the University of Texas at Austin and a JD from Northeastern. And Dimple and I were uh, reminiscing <laughs> about her time here and uh, our dear uh, colleague, Hope Lewis, I would have frequently go to her office, my sanity check, et cetera, uh, and also to be enlightened about everything uh, human rights. And uh, frequently, when I would uh, go to that office, a uh, Dimple uh, would be there. And Hope always spoke very fondly of you. I know she uh, valued your friendship and colleague. Uh, and you as a colleague very much, and she be proud for you to be here uh, with us today. Uh, so after uh, graduating, uh, Dimple uh, was a legal services attorney representing low-wage workers and low-income immigrants. He then became executive director of the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at UC Berkeley, and was the founding program officer with the Security and Rights Collaborative at the Proteus Fund. A national leader in social justice as a funder, advocate, and educator, she has, become, she has come to campus to give a talk entitled, Shifting the Story, Narrative Change in the Time of Trump. As Dimple says on the GSF website, quote, I am inspired by the more just world that is possible, and acts of courage that people make every day to bring that world into being." Close quote. Welcome home, Devil. Please give a round of applause for the 2,200. Um, what a, what a beautiful way to start a thing welcome home. And I have to say, it really does feel like a homecoming. Um, it's, it's a wonderful speaker with you all. So I, um, before I kind of go into this presentation about narrative, and I am really excited to talk to you all about narrative and about this particular moment that we find ourselves in. I wanted to just kind of go back a little bit and just share a little bit about my Northeastern story, um, how it is I came here and uh, sort of the road I traveled a little bit since I left. Um, so I, before coming to law school, worked at the New York Civil Liberties Union, and I ran a new program there. And I, I had the chance to work in an office full of practicing lawyers. And so in coming to law school, I actually had the sense that um, I wasn't quite sure if practice was going to be my path. Um, but I was so excited to come to law school because I wanted to understand 
more deeply the relationship between law and justice. And so I kind of looked out into the world, and at that time, and I would say even today, there actually weren't justice schools. Um, and the closest thing I could find was Northeastern law. And I, I absolutely made the right choice because in coming here, I actually found a community that is centered on justice values. And the training that I got here, the relationships, the mentorship, especially mentorship of hope, um, but actually so many people who are in this room today, um, all sort of put me on a path to take those values out into the world and put them into action. So that's just a little bit about what, why this is so meaningful to me, um, to be here with you all today. Um, so the path, um, it's been 17 years, which is a little bit hard to believe um, since I left here. And that path has included time as a legal services attorney, um, time as a teacher and educator, um, and time as a social justice strategist, which is how I think about the work that I've been able to do in philanthropy. Um, in thinking about coming back here, I was trying to think about what, what have I learned in 17 years about the law? And believe it or not, I, I actually can boil it down to one <laughs> sentence. Um, and it's this. Um, the most enduring legal change comes about when we pair legal strategies with strategies that shift power. And so those are things like organizing, things like movement building, and things like narrative change. And so Northeastern is the kind of place where we have talked a lot, I mean, we did when I was here, and I am sure you do today, about law and organizing. And there's like a whole body of literature about law and organizing. Um, I learned that Courtney Shaw is um, teaching a course here. When I was at UC Berkeley, um, I brought her to, to teach the students because she is kind of the leader in terms of thinking about the role that lawyers can play with social movements. Um, so, act on movements. <laughs> um, and so, what I'm hoping to do with you today is to give you kind of an intro to some of the thinking about, and more than thinking, really just like some of the recent experiments where we see lawyers trying to tackle big narratives. Um, and my hope is that it leaves you more curious and, and has you sort of thinking about the, the larger narratives that we're all contending with in this moment. Um, so just a couple more words before we jump in. So my own work on narrative change um, started in 2008 when I ran the Security Rights Collaborative. So this was a funding project that was set up to target Islamophobia, mostly sort of post 9 11 related Islamophobia. And we funded um, a variety of strategies. So we funded impact litigation, we funded grassroots organizations working in Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Um, we funded strategic communications, right? And after a few years, as I sort of stepped back, it was just clear to me that the biggest barrier to justice that we were facing was this deep and persistent narrative about this entire, a very, very diverse, actually diverse set of communities and the way in which they were all seen through the lens of a national security threat. And we can see that that narrative in part originated in pop culture, right? So think Homeland, think uh, before, I think at that time in particular, this is like 2008, 2009, 2010, if you ever saw a Muslim on TV, no matter what the character was, they would turn out to be a terrorist before, right? So this, there was this like, constant sort of perpetuation of this narrative of um, a threat to terrorists. But then that idea was also sort of solidified in our policies, right? So in no-fly lists, in um, the crackdown on Islamic charity. And so there was a way in which all of these different dynamics worked together to create this barrier. And that's where, where my work began in terms of starting to think about how do we actually get at those, at those stories? Um, and then sort of fast forward to three and a half years ago, 
when I joined the General Service Foundation, we are a social justice funder. We support uh, grassroots organizations working on the front lines to advance racial and gender justice. And we started to see a lot of experimentation amongst our grantees with trying to get at narrative change. And so we began supporting this work, both in terms of what our grantees were doing, but also starting to think about um, beyond the work of individual grantees, how do we actually step back and really amplify the stories that our grantees were telling? And how do we get those stories, not just in front of audiences of thousands, which is what you sort of, our, our grantees were doing organizing, they were kind of reaching like thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. But how do we actually reach millions of people with those stories and with the ideas that are contained in those stories? Um, so one of my sort of passion projects, which I'm not, I'm going to show you a piece of it, I'm not going to talk about it too much, um, but one of my passion projects really at the foundation has been something called the Pop Culture Collaborative that we started with four other foundations, which was, a, it, it is a project to basically bridge the pop culture industries, in particular the entertainment industry, with the social justice world. And I'll show you some, like a little bit of what's come out of that. But our purpose was really to kind of go back to where things like those homeland narratives start and to, to really try to make a change there. Um, all right, so that's all an intro. And then what am I talking about when I say narrative? I've like said the word a hundred times already. Um, so here's the thing. So lawyers are storytellers, right? We are familiar with how we tell a good story. A lot of times when we're preparing our cases, that's what we're doing. A lot of times when we refer to um, great litigators, we say, oh, well, she's an amazing narrator. So for the purposes of this conversation and this talk, when I say narrative, I'm not talking about what happens in the course of the case. When I'm actually talking about public stories, like the higher level stories um, that operate on a different level. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit more about what those are. So um, here's a few definitions. And what's hard is that in the world of narratives and stories, people use these words interchangeably. Um, something I find helpful is this idea that a story is a contained telling of something that happened to someone. A narrative is a collection of stories. Um, and the collection of stories over time comes to represent a core set of beliefs or a core set of ideas. Uh, so there are these three narrative strategists, uh, Jeff Shane, Aaron Cox, and Liz Mann, and they have this metaphor where they say that stories are like stars. They're individual, shiny, bright, they move and inspire us. And they say narratives are a collection of stories like constellations. So think like a collection of stars. Um, when stories are connected together to narratives, they make a deeper kind of sense and meaning. So the thing is that narratives exist in our culture, they're in our media, they're definitely, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and I would say that they're in our courtrooms too, and not just when we bring them in. Um, they're in our courtrooms because our courtrooms are in our culture, right? And so the more that we can start to pay attention to how those narratives operate, the more that we can start to get to that enduring change. <clears throat> so narratives tend to have archetypes. Um, so they tend to have like villains and victims. They have heroes. Um, and because they have these archetypes, there's like a familiarity to them. Um, so one way that you know something is a narrative is that it can feel like common sense. It can feel like something that you know. Um, another narrative strategist that we work with, Brian Spencer, says that um, nar a narrative is stories that people already know and believe to. And I think that's a really insightful point as we think about the power of narrative, this idea that it's not just a story, but it's something that feels so real that it actually dictates how we think that things should go. Um, so what is the significance of, of narratives? Why are they important? Um, so they're important because these are the larger stories that give us mental models for understanding 
the world. So because these stories feel like common sense, they feel so real to us, they, they sort of guide our decision making and they really structure what is possible. Um, so this is a, a quote from the Narrative Initiative, which is a, a big project investing in narrative, um, talking about what narrative, about, about narrative. So they provide us a frame of reference that determine how we comprehend complex realities and define important boundaries between what we imagine to be possible, probable, or practical. They facilitate interpretation of the past, understanding of the present, and a vision for the future. <coughs> Let's see what this looks like in practice. <laughs> so, make America great again. So, this is not just a campaign slogan. It's not just a dog nipple. Um, this is actually a collection of stories. This is a narrative, a very powerful narrative that is operating in this current moment um, that's shaping a whole set of decisions, a whole set of behaviors. It's a story that's being flushed out every time the president tweets. Some of the sub stories that are a part of this are um, Mexicans as racist. Then as victims, when women come forth with incredible stories of abuse. Whole as important to our economy. Um, and of course, the law. So there's a nostalgic element in this story, right? There's a hearkening back to another time. Um, most importantly, the way that this story works is that it, it signals to people so what, not just what is possible, but what the end of the story should be, how things should go. Um, something that I thought about a lot of years is the time that President Trump spent working on the celebrity or census, right? Um, you know, he's been he's been described as as sort of our pop culture president, but I've been thinking about how his role on that show and sort of the skill that he built and the expertise he built was in how you tell a story week after week, how you sort of create a narrative arc that takes people from point A to point B um, and that positions him actually as like so powerful person in the story. And so I think that um, his skill around narrative is, is something that um, we on in the kind of social justice field have not, we've not fully figured out how to contend with it. Um, but if we don't actually engage with this narrative, it's it's at our peril because it's a very powerful narrative. Um, so I want to just quickly here actually share a framework that we use a lot when we think about narrative. So this is John Powell's work. If you're not familiar with his work, it's really important. Um, this is uh, Professor John Powell, who's at UC Berkeley, um, who runs the Haas Institute. And he has this framework, bring and belonging. Um, and he talks basically about how uh, law and policy and narrative play this role of either putting groups within the center of human concern or outside of. And so I, I, I share this you know, very quickly because this is what we see happening with the Make America Great narrative is that it does this work of othering. Right? It puts entire groups of people outside the circle of concern. And then that sets up a whole set of sort of policy realities and um, legal realities for people. So there are other narratives operating right now too. Right? So um, not getting back to names for this, but I think we can call this um, we the people. We could call this a story of belonging. This is a story about who we are as a nation. This is a story about diversity as our strength. This is a story about solidarity. This is a story about deep, renewed engagement in our democracy. This is about a time of awakening and possibility. Um, what is important is to realize that these narratives coexist, right? In some ways, we are in kind of a battle of the story. 
And these are the kind of big stories that are sort of shaping many of the fights that we as lawyers might be engaged in in this moment. So how do we influence narratives? What do we do with the fact that there are these big stories? Um, so one thing to know is that narratives are not organic, early, right? So they are created and they are placed. Um, I've recently been reading Dark Money, uh, highly recommended by Jane Mayer. And one of the things that she really documents <coughs> painstakingly is how the right has funded ideas. Right, how they have invested in ideas, narratives, stories, so that we think that corporations are the most important part of our society, right? So that we think that when corporations win, we all benefit. Um, there's a whole set of things that we sort of take for granted in our laws, in our culture, um, in our reality in this country, in this moment, that were not ideas that existed. 30 years ago. They were things that were invested in and that sort of made their way into our culture. Um, what I find really interesting as I've kind of moved into looking at narratives is um, this question of who else works on narrative, right? So um, what you find in terms of people who have narrative expertise is that they tend to come out of fields like advertising, um, popular culture, marketing, um, social sciences, and cognitive linguistics. <laughs> they basically tend to be people who think about how to shift human behavior. And that's sort of fascinating to me that those of us who are engaged in the work of social don't have ready access to the skill set of how to behavior. Um, but what is changing, what I've seen, is that while narrative has always been an important part of social justice work, the shift that we've seen over the last five to eight years is that it's now actually a job for people doing social justice. But I just wanted to put that out there that we see in the campaigns in particular, the policy campaigns that we fund, there are now jobs called director of culture change. Like that is actually a thing that you can do. Um, and it's actually a critical role. And your director of culture change works very closely with your litigation director and your policy director. And it's a very integrated and important approach to the uh, So even if we are not thinking about narrative strategy, our opponents are. And so I wanted to give you an example on a sort of policy issue that's still playing out right now, family separation. I just pulled these quotes um, to give you a sense of what, of how narrative plays out, right? So this is a tweet from Trump, family separation. Democrats are the problem. They don't care about crime and want illegal immigrants, no matter how bad they may be, to pour into and infest our country like Evans. So that quote is doing a lot of narrative work. It's going back to the Make America Great, Story. Words like infest, right? You know how, what, what do we do when we have an infestation, right? We know, we know how that story ends. Um, who are the enemies? There's lots of enemies actually in a really short quote. There's lots of villains. There's the Democrats, but there's also the illegal immigrants. There's just a, a whole, like, there's a heavy lift happening on the narrative. This is the American Bar Association weighing in on family separation. It's everything in the statement, it's most things in the statement are true. Although the Supreme Court has never addressed a case involving the exact facts, facts presented by the current practice of family separation, existing law suggests that the policy violates rights to family integrity and due process. Moreover, the policy appears particularly unfair in Maine and in the end in effect. Not a lot of narrative work happening there. <laughs> um, it's not clear who, like, is, is the enemy the person who's doing it? Like, who's the, who's the villain? It's, it's, it, there's, not, there's not an understanding or an addressing of the broader narrative. These are advocates that we fund to understand narratives. Families belong together. In three words, they have actually countered the narrative, the prevailing narrative. They've completely shifted who the victims are and who the villains are, right? The villain is anybody who would separate families. 
because they belong together. The victims are the people who are being separated. Um, the heroes are going to be the people who stand with the families that belong together. So this is just a slight sort of shift. I'm going to now actually share with you some examples of what it looks like when we start putting this to be here. But just to kind of begin thinking about whether we are really tackling that higher level. Ah, this works. So I'm going to share a four minute video. Um, this was from the ACLU. Um, and I will warn you that it's a really tough, tough video to watch. I'm on January 15, 2018, I left my home for the rest of the world. Escape to the United States. Our government of the United States will be special from government bonds and others. We fled Honduras after the military moved to Syria's on home. On February 20, 2018, my son and I crossed the international bridge in Brownsville, Texas, and presented ourselves to the person who raised your arms. We told the officers we needed to after I presented myself at bridge. The West Border officer just took me and he begins to be in. The officer took the same in the room. He was our guardian. He was in the United States. The U.S. immigration officers then told me that they were taking my son from me. They said he would be going to one place and I would be going to another. I asked I why the officer took the step right in my son. They did not provide any reason. They did not provide any reason. They did not provide any reason. Any reason. Not any reason. I had no idea that I would be separated from my child. No. He went away from us to make me walk out with my son to recover the vehicle. I placed my son in the car. The immigration officer said that he carried my son to recover the vehicle and placed my son in the car. My son was crying because I couldn't speak to him. He had a son. First of all, she said, I'm going to shut up. She didn't make sense. I was crying. Cried an hour and got that moment before the officers. The immigration officers took me to court. This is about the detention center. I was going crazy. Going crazy, wasn't it? Very worried about him. Did not know where he was. Another detainee told me to write to the immigration officials at the facility to ask about my son. I wrote a request for an asking for information about him. The officers asked if the cell phone told me that he was in while detained in the local metro facilities, I've been able to speak several times to a caseworker charged with my son's case. The caseworker has told me my son's asked for me and cried all the time for the first few days after we were separated. The caseworker says that my son is doing a little better now, but is also having ear infection. I call. I've not been able to speak to my son because he does not really talk yet since he's so young. I need to be able to hold him and reassure him that he's safe and his mother is here for him. My son also needs my care to make sure he's healthy and doing well. During the first weeks after my son and I were separated, I'm sorry to press the court. And not even want to eat. I will try to be strong for my son so that I can work hard to be reunited and to take care of him once we are together. I'm so sorry to be strong for my son. On April 3rd, 2018, I received a positive, credible fear finding from a San Antonio immigration judge. I understand that I will now be able to present my asylum claim in the immigration court. I would never that, that I need, need to do such protection in the United States. States. It would not, not be safe for my I declare under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state. That the foregoing is true and correct based on my personal knowledge. Executing to a Texas legal state. Um, this video, because I think it represents a really significant shift 
for the ACLU's understanding of the audience for their work. And um, so the Department of Homeland Security and President Trump have created a, a deep narrative of the criminality of people who are coming to the border, right? And so this video basically uses attorney work product. It's, this is a reading of the affidavit that was part of the case, right? So they're literally taking the stories that we are, that we get to hold as advocates, the stories that we come across as lawyers, they're taking that story and they're amplifying it and they're giving it a broader audience than that that we would normally expect. So usually the audience for this story would be a judge, right? Or it would be um, a jury, depending on the context. Um, maybe it would be law students who read the case from somewhere down the, the line. You would not normally have the, the details of this case in a viral video, but this in this moment, this is what's needed, right? Like, a, um, so when you think about a narrative of criminality, and then you think about the reality of someone who's not old enough to talk, right? and the way that that fact just deconstructs the, the story that's being put out there. Um, it's, it's powerful, I think. Um, so I'm going to go from this now to another example. And um, this is an example of the Me Too, an example from the Me Too movement. And I'm not really going to talk about it. I think has um, received a lot of attention. But I'm going to talk about the work of Monica Ramirez, um, who is a lawyer with the uh, Alliance for Farm Worker Women. Um, and I'm going to tell you about her work, what she did. So just, just so that we're all talking about the same story, in October of 2017, the New York Times broke a story about Herbie Weinstein and um, just the horrendous details of sexual abuse and exploitation of women in Hollywood. Um, and then for a few weeks after that, these stories kept kind of coming out. Um, they all centered on mostly women working in the entertainment industry. Part of the shock um, that people like that have sort of experienced was how privileged these women were, um, how uh, you know, they were sort of movie stars, right? And so there was a shock that, that these kinds of abuses could have been happening. Um, on November 12th, um, Monica released this open letter. I'm just going to read you pieces of it. Um, on behalf of 700,000 female farm workers, and it was a letter to their sisters in the entertainment industry. Um, so this is from the letter. Dear sisters, we write on behalf of the approximately 700,000 women who work in the agricultural fields and packing sheds across the United States. For the past several weeks, we have watched and listened with sadness as we have learned of the actors, models, and other individuals who have come forward to speak about the gender-based violence they experience at the hands of bosses, co-workers, and other powerful people in the entertainment industry. We wish that we could say we're shocked to learn that this is a pervasive problem in your industry. Sadly, we're not surprised because it's a reality we know far too well. Farm worker women across our country suffer in silence because of the widespread sexual harassment and assault they face at work. So she goes on to say, we do not work under bright stage lights or on the big screen. We work in the shadows of society in isolated fields and packing houses that are out of sight and out of mind for most people in this country. Your job feeds souls, fills hearts, spreads joy. Our job nourishes the nation with the fruits, vegetables, and other crops we plant, pick, and pack. In these moments of despair, and as you cope with scrutiny and criticism because you've bravely chosen to speak out, against the harrowing acts that were committed against you, please know that you're not alone. We believe you and stand with you. So a few weeks after this letter came out, over a thousand women working in film and television and entertainment signed on to a response to this letter. And it was an open letter that was published in the New York Times. And this is just, again, a piece of it. To the members of Alianza and farm worker women across the country, we see you, we thank you, 
and we acknowledge the heavy weight of our common experience of being preyed upon, harassed, and exploited by those who abuse their power and threaten our physical and economic security. To every woman employed in agriculture who has had to fend off unwanted sexual advances from her boss, every housekeeper who has tried to escape an assaulted guest, every janitor trapped nightly in a building with a predatory supervisor, every waitress grabbed by a customer and expected to take it with a smile, every garment and factory worker trade forced to trade sexual acts for more shifts, every domestic worker or home health aide forcibly touched by a client, Every immigrant woman silenced by the threat of her undocumented status, being reported in retaliation for speaking up, and to women in every industry who are subjected to indignities and offensive behavior that they are expected to tolerate in order to make a living, who stand with you, who support you. Nine days later, at the Golden Globes, you had this scene. Um, this is Monica. With Laura Dern. Um, the other people out there, you might know them. Aijin Fu from National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, Saru, you should have Saru in here. She's amazing. From Rock. Um, Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too movement, and some other famous people. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not sharing the about kind of letters to say um, that if you write a letter, you go to Golden Globes. Um, although that might be true, but um, these actresses brought activists as their front ones um, to the Golden Globes um, and then used their red carpet speeches to basically tell the story of those letters, to connect the casting couch to the daily harassment and violence that is faced by restaurant workers and domestic workers. And the narrative shift that was kind of accomplished through these two letters through this, like through these photo opportunities, was one where the narrative shifted to being from being about um, privileged, wealthy actresses who were complaining to being about a workplace issue, right? This got framed as something that was impacting women workers. Um, and the frame was a frame of solidarity. So, at this event, um, at the Golden Globes, uh, there was an announcement made about the Times of Legal Defense Fund. Um, and in the two weeks following this, um, the Golden Globes, they raised $21 million in individual donations to cover um, legal fees for low-income women bringing sexual harassment cases. Um, and an amazing Northeastern alum, Sabine Chandy, actually uh, manages that project at the National Women's Law Center. Um, but what I wanted to share was a few weeks after the Golden Globes, um, through our Pop Culture Collaborative, um, I had the chance to be in a room with, with some of these people. So we brought, we brought together actually some of the activists, people like Alicia Garza, Tarana Burke, Monica, um, with some of uh, uh, their counterparts in Hollywood. We brought them together for this intimate dinner strategy session to think together about how to move forward. And to me, the most moving moment was this moment where um, one of the, the women from the entertainment industry sort of leaned forward and said to Monica, when you wrote that letter, when you said, it's all of us, this became a movement. I wanted to share this example because one of the things that you learn to do here is you learn how to write really good letters. And so, <laughs> so I, I think there's something um, really powerful about thinking about how to take these tools that we have and how to use them in a way that meets the moment, right? So I have one more example, and then I'm really excited to hear your questions. Um, so this is this is. Uh, this is a grant that we recently made. This is a work in progress. Um, so we, for a long time, have funded an organization <laughs> called the New Orleans Workers Center for Racial Justice. Uh, they got started in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and they represented um, workers, mostly migrant <laughs> workers, uh, who came in to rebuild the city after Katrina. And it probably won't surprise any of you to learn that these workers were exploited in so many ways. 
Um, they were not paid wages that they were due. They were not given um, basic protective gear uh, to use when they were doing their work. And in fact, what we saw was that that not only happened after Hurricane Katrina, but this actually happens, happened and happens after all my um, so Stackett Tony was the executive director there, um, and they, he's not a lawyer, but they had a team of lawyers, and he started to think about how, um, despite all of their legal work, and they have some very significant legal wins, um, that really what they were up against was this narrative that there were two pieces to. So one was the narrative that um, the workers that they were representing were illegal, um, and were stealing American jobs. And so the idea was that because they were illegal and they were stealing jobs that belonged to that belonged to somebody else, that all of these protections that they were trying to get for these workers were not were somehow were not, were not due to them. And so he recently um, spun off a project called the Guest Workers Alliance, and they are now solely focused on shifting that narrative. Um, and this work has it literally just started, like we just made the grant back in November. Um, but here's what they're trying to do. He is trying, and their team is trying to create a new identity, an alternative identity to take those workers who are seen as illegal and sort of move them into. And that identity is resilience worker. And the idea is that in places where you have natural disasters, there comes a time where you have to rebuild. And that these are the workers that make that rebuilding possible. And so these workers are critical to our resilience as a community. And what they're testing, what their theory is, is that by creating that category and moving their workers into that category, that they're going to have a shift on the legal side. That, the, that both the type of exploitation that might happen will be different, but also when there is exploitation, that the remedies will be different. And so um, there's, they have an elaborate strategy, which it, what's interesting to me about the project is that it's one of the few things that we're funding that's about doing narrative work in place. So they're focused on places where hurricanes are bound to happen. So they're starting in Florida. And they're working locally. And there are different kinds of strategy, but they include things like working with local governments to set up resilience worker awards. Um, it's working with news stations to start planting that language of resilience worker. And then there's lots of other elements to it as well. Um, but this is, so they had not even officially really started um, their work this summer when um, there was the whole caravan story. Um, and they just put this out on social media because the caravan thing was happening right at the same time that there was Hurricane Michael that hit Florida. So they put out this image, and it's a story about someone um, who has roots in Honduras and is rebuilding not just an American city, but is rebuilding City Hall in that city. Um, so that is the third example. And then here are my questions for you. These are just things that I want you to kind of take away and think about. Um, what are the kind of narratives in the area that you work in as you're doing your legal and advocacy work? Are you uh, shifting those narratives? Are you reinforcing them? Um, how do you amplify stories that you get to come across as a lawyer? Um, it's an incredible power, actually, to be the holder of people's stories. So how do we think about that power? How do we use that power? How do we balance the ethical obligations that we have uh, to provide zealous representation with the risk that comes from other narratives? Um, and then for legal educators, are there ways that we can heighten sensitivity to the narrative context of the cases that we are teaching? And I know that many of you at Northeastern already do this. I know, for example, Professor Williams in one of your classes, that that's a big part. When you talk about poverty, you're talking about the narratives around poverty. Um, those are my questions, and I'm really excited to hear the questions you have.
learned in your time out there. Um, so I guess I my question is a little bit rooted in your questions. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about the as so I'm totally persuaded how important your are. Uh, definitely no no response but that. Um, but I'm wondering about some of the hazards. Um, and the one and the the Me Too one is the one that jumps out at me most profoundly, right? That it's it's been so effective at raising the profile of some serious injustices that are in the real daily lives of so 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 many people. At the same time, that narrative that has co I'm not blaming any one person, but that has coalesced, I think, from all of the voices that have contributed to that have like I, I read that and I thought, where are the um, men and boys who've been victims? And I and even more subtly, you know, what uh, uh, even just the the fact of men and women and men and women and women, constant reproduction of that duality and the hierarchy of it, um, and the who's the victim always. The, those pieces of it are are alarming to me in the Me Too. And uh, you know, it's not an accusation because I know, you know, even though I teach in this area, I, I've done at least as much damage in the words that come out of my mouth as I have in trying to disrupt those things. Uh, but I guess um, I'm just—I don't want to sound like the ABA did, where you sort of <laughs> break away from the simple story that is familiar yeah. in the way that you were describing that you wind up being kind of useless. But I also fear some of the collateral effects of a narrative like that, that on the one hand is drawing important attention, on the other hand, I think is actually doing some harm. So what I hear in your question is, was that, is, is this narrative inclusive enough? Is that part of your question? Well, also, like, how do we make the ethical choice about, you know, on the one hand, ringing true and familiar, but on the other hand, we on the left progressive side are also, some, uh, you know, dealing with competing interests and competing, you yeah. know, problems that to sort of address one sometimes can raise another. So when it comes to the Me Too narrative, I'll, t I'll tell you what stands out for me. Um, so it's, you know, in preparing for this talk, I was just kind of Googling, like looking at the New York Times to see how the aftermath of the movement was covered. What I found interesting is, you know, there, there were all of these um, articles talking about how like in February, you know, there were 81 powerful men who had been removed from their positions and their corporations and in kind of high profile industries, right? Um, but what like back at home in Oakland, um, what I saw was um, our local restaurant, like my favorite restaurant, it turned out that like 17 women who worked there um, over the course of like many years <laughs> had been, you know, systematically and chronically abused by the owner and chef. And this moment allowed for them to come forward, right? And so um, I think, I, I think it's hard for us to ever get a, like to any one narrative that's fully inclusive. Um, but I lift like I lift this up because that had been going on for years in that restaurant. Um, but it was not perceived as possible for for these employees, these women employees in the positions they were in, to speak up against like the beloved chef of Oakland. That was not a possible thing. And I think this linking up and, and this sort of saying, what is happening to you in Hollywood is not about, this is about women not having control over their bodies in the context of work. That allowed for, the, for it to sort of spread throughout our economy, right? So it may be that it may be imperfect in that it may not capture all the different kinds of abuses, but it, sort of the, contrast was was not perfect either in that there was such an invisibility of the experience of so many working women and this narrative shift kind of shed light on and created a possibility for for people to be visible and to and to speak up 
I don't know, does that, I, I can see your face, you're like, that's like, yeah. <laughs> And as you know, they use that power of attorney or already one level removed from the people whose experiences were advocating on behalf of, right? And so right. at the ACLU, they were taking an already level removed affidavit and now using very famous people to tell that story that now of this woman who no one has any idea what she was, like, <laughs> what her son was like. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do we get from changing the narrative to empowering the people whose narratives are changing? It seems almost like that, right? That so, is it our work that we should be amplifying voices, or should we be amplifying the opportunities for them to tell their own stories? Are they only getting heard because you know Idris Elba or Diana was up and who doesn't want to watch it? Right. Yeah. No, I love. I love your. Yes, yes, yes. We want people to own their own stories and we want people to have a platform to tell those stories. And in this moment, um, if something with Ibris Alba or whoever the other famous people were, um, if that if that garners a wider, I think that's the important too. The reality is that um, like all of those things are happening. So the the story, Miriam, whose story, and she she did a um, op-ed on CNN.com. I don't think that it, it, it had an audience. I don't think it got the same level of attention as this video, right? So people come to this video because it's it's a set of artists, validators, people that they care about. And those people, by reading the story, are saying, we care about this too. I think it reaches people who are not already paying attention. I think it reaches people who are like who maybe otherwise wouldn't look like maybe they would watch a movie that one of these people is in because they're a fan. They may not on their own be looking to see like what's the thing that happened to Marion. So I I think it's um I'm absolutely with you that like people need to own their stories and I think that like my end goal in doing this work is like, we need to shift who gets to tell the story. And then within this moment, like I think, you know, if if this video had not happened, like there's a lot of people who wouldn't have known about the story, but I'm with you. I feel like Marion should have been telling her story. Yeah, thank you. Um Joanne, I'm a one. Um thank you so much for I uh, have a question about sort of the legal field in general. Um, I really appreciated you coming here and, and challenging us to think about narratives. And it made me think about how narratives and storytelling have been a part of cultures across the world for millennia. And beyond like a method for advertising and marketing, it has just been a, a basis for community. Um, especially or, oral storytelling yeah. and ancestry and history. Um, and how bringing this up here almost makes it seem seem almost separate from this field of law. And I'm wondering if you could speak to, um, at a micro level, a macro level, uh, how this can be incorporated into law and what the challenges are there um, beyond just changing like how we share affidavits. Um, more implicitly. Yeah, I really, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate your kind of insight and I just agree with you completely that there is actually something so human about the act of storytelling and that this has been kind of at the center of, you know, when I, when I talked about kind of how narratives work, we are programmed as, as humans to um, understand the world in terms of story. Um, what I'm partly trying to say is that we, sometimes we look at that in a very narrow way in the concept of legal work, in that we think about, and maybe the narrowness has to do with who we think we're telling stories to, um, 
right? So the idea that um, we are preparing for not just a small audience, the judges and jury, but a very elite audience. I think we, we, we imagine our kind of context that we are in as, as just being a context of legal decision makers, right? And so part of what I'm saying is that we are, we do have the histories of storytelling. We come into this profession and we are working with stories um, and that there's, I'm not saying like make a viral video, I'm saying like we, we have to think more strategically about what do we do with these stories? Who, who gets to tell them? I think that's like a key question, but who gets to hear them? Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Professor Baker. Oh, and then. So um, my question is, is kind of the, the uh, systemic change that has to happen after the narrative has changed. And whether the narrative can do more work than being the book that gets people's attention and makes them maybe see the world in a new way, but that doesn't lead them automatically to the operational, systemic, pragmatic work that has to be done for the change to occur. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how the narrative book is being used instrumentally in the actual pragmatic work of seeking structural change. So your point is actually is is absolutely right that the narrative in and of itself won't change the structure. Um, but I would say that the structure rarely changes without some shift in the narrative. Right, so these are these are kind of companion strategies, um, and the, the to me the question is like how are we how are we approaching that work in an integrated way? There's a lot of work that's out there that sort of policy change work or more broadly structural change work that is missing uh, any sort of narrative or culture change component. And sort of going back to my point about how do we get that enduring legal change? Like you can win, right? I think that, I mean this is partly the story of the reproductive rights <coughs> movement in this country, going way back. But you know, sort of like we won certain legal protections, but we have not done that culture change work. And so for years, for decades now, we've been sort of having this like this this cultural, legal, political policy nightmare fight because that that companion piece of the culture change narrative is working. So yeah, it's a it's a hook, but it's more than a hook. It's it's like a, a companion approach, a companion strategy. This, this is part of the question. Part of it is just much more practical than some of these other questions. Assuming that I mean, of course you're right that narrative change is critical. How do we figure out what is an effective actor to change narrative? I mean, the you know the entertainment industry, the advertising industry, they spend enormous sums of money on focus groups, on surveys, on psychological research, on all sorts of stuff. Can we do this without doing that? And then that brings me to the second part of the question: If we do that. And if we discover that the only way to do effective narrative change in some areas is to really oversimplify, to distort, to delimit the scope of what we're saying, then we come back to Libby's question of how yeah. do we then yeah. resolve the trade-offs? I'm really worried that you know, I, I'm convinced we need to do this. I fear that we are buying the devil's prescription. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to just say, for all the students in the room, it's really fun to come back 17 years later. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand the point of the movement. Oh, sorry, yeah. So here's the thing, what you both are doing. We are all about, right? We're all about the exceptions, about 
you know, the rule, but then there's all the exceptions. Yeah, that is a legitimate fear that something will be lost. And what is helpful is, is to think of these narratives as not being the end all be all, but being like very large containers. This is not the rule book. This is not the, the narrative, is not the policy. The narrative is what makes the policies possible. But does that get at it? So we can, we maybe what we need to do is build very flexible, very like overarching wide narratives that can hold the complexity of the work. But they do because narratives hold our. So they do. And we are absolutely in a moment that's a values moment. We're fighting about what is important, who do we value, what are our values. Right, so it, it's just a mistake for us in the profession that we're in to not engage because we're nervous about what might get lost. Um, and then to your, there's so many other questions, but to your first question about how do we do this, I mean, I'm actually very honest, like anyone who tells you that they know is, is just, is not being, that, that, that's not true, we don't know, we don't know how to do this. That is something that I, I so appreciate about the role that I'm in right now is that we're, we're trying to figure it out, we're blending experiments. Some of them are about, we're trying to learn from people in advertising. Some of it's about, we're trying to learn from people, you know, who are storytellers in Hollywood. Some of it's about trying to connect these things up, right? So, I mean, today, if there were a homeland that was being made, um, it, it, we would make sure that there is a, um, you know, that there are like, People from the Muslim community who are advising on that show. Um, when you watch something like Good Wife and you see stories that are about how bail doesn't work, about cash bail not work, that's because you have organizations like Color, Color of Change that are working in writers' rooms. And one of the videos that I didn't get to, if somebody wants to see it after my talk, I'm happy to show it, is um, something that came out of a grant we did connecting up um, Define America with Shonda Rhimes' writer's room and producing a show on Grey's Anatomy about a dreamer, a dreamer, right? And it completely undoes your idea of who a dreamer is. So that's like one, these are, there's lots of different kind of ways to approach it. And I feel like we're trying to experiment with different things and see what works. Um, but the starting point is that we need to engage. I'm Ms. Vivian, I'm considering law, and I currently work in higher ed, so I do a lot of social justice. So this is like everything that I love. Um, I think what I'm struggling with is I do a lot of storytelling with student activists, um, college campuses, and it's hard, like that's a great skill set to develop, but it's hard to strategize it when you're competing, like you're fighting against people who don't realize that is like working on existing narratives that have been so embedded like legally institutionally throughout all these aspects of our society so this is a this is amazing work but when you're trying to educate people you know on the right or people who have really extreme um, and degrading beliefs about others um, is it really an effective long-term strategy to dismantle right it's essentially the ignorant um when we say is it, I mean there's lots of different ways that we get that we can get our narratives. What I would say is in this moment, I mean in part the reason that we've been doing some experimentation in the pop culture space is that in this moment there are actually very few spaces that people come together in across the political spectrum. Right? So if you look at how we consume news, for example, um, you know, I I was in a gym in Texas recently, and literally they had two TVs, and one was Fox and one was CNN, like side by side. It was not time. I mean, literally the same things are happening, and you have like two different stories coming out. And the reality is most people don't watch both, right? So you get either your MSNBC or your Fox News version. Um, and in general, that that is the phenomena of polarization, that we have very few spaces where people are actually come together. So what, what we've found is um, pop culture is actually one of those few spaces, whether it's like the NFL and watching sports, 
right? Like why, why are we having such a heated debate about that? Well, it's actually a place where people come together, political spectrum. Um, so you can actually reach people um, or, you know, television or music. So that's, I mean, I think, you know, your question about like, will just a story reach someone and change their mind? I'm, I'm sort of not sure about whether like an individual story can change someone's mind, because as you said, I think people already kind of have what they believe. And so it's hard to kind of reach people when you're just trying to kind of make a case. I want to support you against my skeptical colleagues <laughs> with two, with two uh, brief examples. My world of tobacco control, uh, something is an individual choice and a liberty that uh, needs to be respected by uh, people choose to smoke and not smoke and uh, useful for the tobacco industry and both fighting uh, lawsuits and in uh, fighting even uh, bans on smoking in public places. Uh, and that has largely been substituted with the uh, narrative that the tobacco industry uh, are premier liars and uh, um, have uh, basically sold an addictive and deadly a product and lied about it, which I think is uh, these are both master narratives, but I think they've really changed. Uh, I think the, uh, the current one, I believe, is true, and uh, pretty much everything we want to say in the tobacco control movement is consistent with that and fits in that. It's not as if this is a separate slogan we've picked up that we've sort of made use of. It. It's in some sense a way of organizing the uh, way we uh, and we think and have gotten, you know, uh, legislatures, courts, uh, the general public uh, to think about this. The second one is the uh, movie, I don't know how many people have seen, I guess it's a matter of sex, the uh, uh, latest uh, RPG move, uh, movie. Uh, you know, seen it? It's, it, and there's a wonderful moment there where the uh, She's trying a case before the 10th Circuit uh, involving, uh, and she's carefully picked it because speaking of how you how do you organize narratives, we picked this case which was discrimination against the man. Uh, uh, picking up Libby's point too, that okay, you make the point in a way that, hey, wait a second, this thing uh, uh, actually limits what men can do or boys can do. So what the, uh, government had uh, carefully researched, uh, done the uh, uh, wonderful scene. They had these huge computers with these wheels trying to do a search that you can have to do with Google to figure out every statute that uh, uh, distinguishes between what men and women you know, uh, are entitled to do, benefits they have, and, and so forth. And they'd come up with 150. And their argument is, Your Honor, if you give them on this one, you know, you go with the plaintiffs on this one, you're going to throw out 150 uh, statutes here. This is a, uh, you know, uh, earth shattering change you're looking for. And, you know, don't do it. You know, they're pretending that this is a little case, but it's a big case. And, you know, in the book, at least, you know, what happened in reality, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg comes back in the four minutes she had reserved for. Uh, rebuttal argument and said uh, she wants to thank the government for coming up with 150 ways in which you know your sons or your daughters are not going to be able to live the kind of life they want uh, because of pre-existing uh, assumptions. Uh, they had cited the case from the 19th century, uh, Bradwell, I think, was, whatever, the case that said women can't be lawyers, and, and she she went with that and said, you know, this has been uh, a long time and it's about time we stop it. That, you know, at least in the movie, but I think it also symbolized, you know, in the movement itself, a reconceptualization of what is this about, taking some of the raw, the same raw material that's being used by the other side and just changing the perspective on it uh, and going with it. And I think successful movements need to do that. 
and I think it's available, and I don't think it's artificial or Hollywood or something. It may be helped by Hollywood or Madison Avenue, but, but I think it's also real, and if you can see it and go with it and run with it, I don't think you know, any uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had any uh, uh, PR advisors doing this thing. At some point, you just look at the thing and say, hey, wait a second, there's a better way to look at it. I think that's I think that's absolutely right, and it's the work that movements have always done, right? If it's if it rises to the level of a successful movement, it's it's it's, it's changed our understanding of what's possible. It's changed the deeply told stories of them. Thank you for coming to my rescue. Thank you very much, Professor Claire. Well, uh, it may be getting late, but I wondered if in the number four, the balance between zealous representation. The risk of perpetuating bad narratives. Yeah. So uh, uh, I can't think of a single course I've ever taught where one time or another it came up that the lawyers made a winning argument on behalf of social justice, but it was a terrible argument because it it, it, it created a it perpetuated a bad narrative. Uh, uh, so. Uh, I, I can't I, think of examples. Uh, I, this always comes up, and yeah. I always say uh, the, the lawyer should not have put that argument and, and risk losing the case, should have found some other way. And of course, you always can fall back to, well, it's up to the client to decide, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the client doesn't, this is often not in a position to make that decision. Anyway, what do you say, what, what do your grantees say? about uh, do they find themselves making creative changes to shift the narrative and then they go into the courtroom and they you know they say uh, a tired old legal argument because it can't win. Well that's where the relationship between for clients and movements is so key, right? Because when you just have like a client that's not connected, that's not part of people who are organizing, that's not part of something bigger, you probably will not have the client. That client is going to say, like, do what you need to do for me. Um, when you have clients that feel like they're part of something bigger, then the conversation becomes a bigger one. Um, I mean, where I've seen this come up a lot is with dreamers, right? With um, And, you know, I think the you know, I think about, um, so I, I served on the board of the Asian Law Caucus years, and we had a program that was for undocumented youth. And um, one, of the, one of the students in that program would always say, don't call us dreamers. We're not the dreamers, our dreamers. Right? Our parents are the ones who came here with the dream. And it's such a simple statement, but so powerful in terms of just reframing. I mean, and it, was, it was his way of saying, it's it's not enough that I have a status if that status is based on criminalizing my parents, right? Um, if if the narrative is that because I was you know I was brought here you know unknowingly that I should have these opportunities, well, what about the fact that someone knowingly brought me here with great dreams? So I mean I think that it it, it comes up and it's hard because the dreamer narrative is one that you know really stuck. And then I feel like we like it, it stuck and it took off and took hold. And and if you talk to people who are activists in that community, it's one that you know people are very have, have a, a deep critique about. That's an example of how I see the tradition. Um, I first want to say um, I hope all of you who are Newsol current Newsol law students. Uh, can see who you can be <laughs> 17 years after you graduate. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I also want to say on Wednesday, uh, uh, Professor uh, Aziza Ahmed has worked with Dimple to put together an amazing panel. Uh, they're bringing in five advocates in the local area to carry this conversation further and talk about how they have used narrative and how they struggle with narrative in their legal practice. So I really encourage all of you to come at noon in this room uh, on Wednesday to, to really carry this further and ask more questions. I think it's gonna be just extraordinary. 
Um, and then Dimple, of course, is uh, meeting with groups that want to talk about um, being a woman of color uh, at, when you're starting your legal career, also meeting with uh, students that want to talk about uh, doing alternative careers in the public interest. And then she's available to meet with uh, you in individually or in groups as well. She's here through Wednesday. So we are so delighted to have you here, Dimple. Thank you so much.